Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, the Cube Podcast, episode 42. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is our weekly podcast. We review everything we're looking at, analyzing, and uh, talking about, and mainly looking out in the future and the trends, bringing together the Cube research, formerly Wikibon, the Cube video and network and community, and of course, SiliconANGLE's coverage all kind of discuss the days and, and weeks ahead. Dave, a lot of action. Great to see you. Happy New Year. Hey John. First Happy pod New Year. of 2024. And uh, wow, what, what an end how was the, How was the snow in Tahoe? Literally on the West Coast is no snow. I saw some uh, p- tweets and posts from Black Home Whistler, British Columbia. It's like mud flowing everywhere. Really? Uh, Tahoe had uh, about two feet of base, um, roughly, and then they got eight inches. So we had good one good day there. Nice. And, I heard even in Vermont, there's nothing up there. The broke no. lakes aren't frozen. Nothing's happening, um, except it's coming. I hear on your side, you get a little storm coming. Yeah, we're gonna finally get get some snow. But uh, but so the skiing was was pretty good then. We had I had one good day skiing, and um, and th- I really took a break with kids coming home. Um, my daughter Jacqueline and her her, her boyfriend in Manhattan. Um, a lot of good New York stories coming up on the cube, so I can't wait to talk about that. But just great New Year to reflect. Um, really kind of did a detox, Dave, uh, after reInvent, um, took some time, not a lot of tweeting, although some targeted tweets uh, I put out there, mainly because I saw some news I wanted to comment on and identify some of the trends that a lot of people have been talking about. So um, other than that, took a little detox, kind of zoomed out, took a perspective, trying to put the goals together for 2024. You know, in in the um, the landscape of media right now, it's a bloodbath. I mean, Cheddar just had a furlough companies going under in the digital media area. Um, thankfully, our business is robust and our investment in you know free content, network effect, high quality analysis, community, and real hardcore data and analysis has been paying off. Not a lot of, um, not a lot of other companies can, can pull that off. And so we've been doing well. So I was very thankful this year that we got a great team. Our um, 13 years of the cube going on our 14th season and SiliconANGLE. I'm super thankful for, for our team, our customers that support us and sponsors and our audience who over the holiday did a lot of outreach and little testing with, and and I think it's going to be a year of the community for us this year. And so I'm very thankful to reflect on that. And I'm super excited to gas it up in 2024 with the cube, um, go out and change how we do uh, event coverage. And I- I'm pumped. I had I have this uh, this calendar on my wall. It's like a little little calendar white. You know, you can you can write on it and erase it. It's like an eraser calendar. Yeah. And I took down last year's and put up uh, like last week, just before New Year's. I put up the new one, and I started filling it in. And it's like already, <laughs> it's this sea of black ink. I'm yeah. like, oh boy. Yeah. My my wife did was like, when are you traveling again next? I'm like, uh, let's not have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, there's a lot of things going on. What's interesting is is that um, you know, one of the things I did over the holidays was really personally reflecting on our 13 years together with Cube and you and I partnering. Just, it's almost like a whole nother inflection point. This whole AI wave has brought our business to an inflection point, and you know, it reminded me of that Andy Grove talk he gave at MIT in 1996. The atoms are not yet clear, and they're going to come together and you know, I saw Matt Baker's post at, at Dell about RAG and some of the things we've been seeing early. You know, this this AI everywhere all the time, everywhere all the time moment is early compelling for our business, what we've invested in. And so I had a lot of personal reflection. And I think this year, my personal goal um, is to lean into AI heavily, go deeper into that rabbit hole and bring that, uh, expand that in from our business perspective, but also do more out and talking about going to New York and having a good presence there. Got great feedback there. Um, Cube Global's looking good again, back on the table. So we're kind of post the COVID back to 2019. It feels like kind of the things that we were thinking about in 2019 are on the table. And so um, I'm super excited. I think it's going to be a year of, of, of uh, reinvention for the Cube. I think it's going to be a year of new things. And AI has been the hype. And, and again, and the news is all over the place. Again, it's AI everywhere, platform, media scale. And it's going to be interesting. A lot of but, fake data coming out, fake content. AI is being, like we predicted, it's going to start polluting you know, the market. I did my look back, you know, like you say, it's time of the year to reflect. And one of, one of my personal big goals in 2023 was to just do more research, you know, non-paid editorial research, like I, I'm done with breaking analysis. I was, I was really stoked that we hit almost 650,000 downloads this year. We had great guests. 
I think the fact that we did, what did we do? Four super clouds this year and three super, super studios. And what I liked about them is even though the super studios were paid, they were uh, industry events, community events, thought leadership, you know, by, with, with sponsors, you know, like IBM, like Vast and like Dell, who weren't just trying to pimp their products. They were really putting forth thought leadership for, for customers and talking about transformation and disruption. And so that was really good. And of course the super clouds continue. We've got, we've already got our next super cloud scheduled for uh, February 13th, John. Yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting. I want to go through my some of my high-level prediction areas that's coming up. I know you've got a prediction breaking analysis you just did, but let's just go through a quick rundown of what I want to talk with you about today. I got the AI all the time. Uh, we'll get into the predictions. I got some 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 summary buckets forming that you'll see uh, us focus on this year, but let's get into some cool news dates. So let's do a quick rundown. Um, Microsoft just unveiled their Copilot keyboard key. First keyboard change in 30 years. That's huge. Now, that is personal because it's our generation of, of it. Um, and then OpenAI, again, more hype coming from OpenAI. Their revenue is talking about $1.6 billion, and they're going to launch their GPT store next week. That got delayed because of the whole debacle and the leadership crisis. And that was supposed to happen in November. Um, and then also AI, OpenAI is offering media companies $1 to $5 million to license the content on the heels of the New York Times suing them for content. So you're going to start to see training uh, sites being paid for. That's notable because we talked about it on the QPod and the Cube AI. We'll come to that. Her perplexity, which was on stage at Reinvent, company company we talked about on the Cube a lot, has just got huge funding. They just raised um, seventy four million at a five hundred twenty million dollar valuation. Actually, I think that's kind of low. I think they could have probably got more, but that's a good round for those investors. And then Intel and uh, uh, I mean we know all we know a lot about and been following. And a Cube alumni that was on SuperCloud 4, the one that you quoted about that thought exercise, yep. Arun, he's now the CEO of Intel's new independent enterprise gen AI software firm called Articulate AI. So great to see Cube alumni form. And another Cube alumni, Justin Hotard, has been picked up from HPE to move to Intel HP, to run yeah. their data center AI group to replace another Cube alumni, Sandra Riviera. So, so, um, you know, that's a Cube alumni on the move action there. So that's super exciting. Bitcoin went over 45 as ETF uh, is approvals have gone through, anticipating that. And then just more doom and gloom on the startups uh, scene. Again, as we had predicted on the Cube, startups are going to fall out of the sky and new ones going to be born. Yet the seed funding rounds are significantly strong in AI and other areas. So again, transformation shift, this cultural revolutions happening that's going to be our focus section at the end of the pod as i've said many times and we've talked about a digital revolution is coming it's i call it the digital hippie revolution what happened in the 60s is going to happen kind of from a digital perspective and you're already seeing that with ai it's a complete generational shift um this is not your your father's internet anymore and, and there's some stories that came out i want to talk about that so that's the rundown dave ai everywhere any anywhere all all the time that's what's happening and AI is everywhere all the time. So that's, you know, again, more of the same. So, you know, you mentioned that Matt Baker post, which caught my attention. I, I didn't see it actually when it got posted, but I was doing some back channeling um, emails with him today. And he said, yeah, like I said in my post. So I went to his LinkedIn and I saw you had commented. So I commented on your comment and basically his premise was all about, you know, really uh, I thought aligned well with the power law that the Cube Research put out of LLMs on really the long tail of smaller models. You can do so much more with uh, smaller models. I think he said, it's like putting a dollar in a machine and getting $2 back. Um, and so, and, and then somebody from Google chimed in and said, hey, you know, I'd like to debate you on some of the uh, uh, assumptions that you're making here. And I'd, I'd love to have that bait, the debate publicly. You know, Matt, Matt Baker, for those of you who don't know, he was the senior vice president of strategic planning at Dell for a number of years. And so, you know, you're in that job. I mean, you gotta be, have a, you know, quite a, 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 an observation space. And they put him on the head of strategy for AI now at Dell. So he goes deep, he's a super smart guy. He's, he's, I like Matt because he doesn't let you get away with bullshit. He'll call BS on you. Um, and, but, but I thought his post was, was thoughtful. I know, and I, my comment, John, was you and you have been on that from from early on in the cycle, and so uh, I was pretty, pretty, pretty confident that uh, 
that they're you, you guys are in the right direction, my view. Well, I mean, we, you know, we he and I both talked about LinkedIn, but when we had the um, big analyst review with all their top execs, I, I think I was contrarian from all the other analysts out there that said, you know, oh, large language models. At that time, all the top analysts were seeing the value. Other ones, other ones were poo-pooing it or just like not understanding it. The fake analysts, um, but the but the re the real analysis was that it was a lot brewing in the open source because the canary in the coal mines in open source is the developers. And so when you see the large language models come up, it was apparent to us that this long tail was going to emerge for the power laws. We published it. That to me was the around um, April, Mar May timeframe when the hallucinations just started to emerge. It was very clear that the hallucinations were all not, were not going to go away. They were going to be managed by more data, but we, had identified, hence now our new set of research that you're driving, this data layer or this new super cloud data modeling going on is changing the game because hallucinations are directly result of bad data, right? Not enough data or the wrong data at the, in the wrong place or the right data not in the right place. And so Matt Baker was on this too. So he and I were riffing. And then so when we saw that the smaller models were emerging in open source, you only had to be a little bit smart to realize, hmm, what if, CPU and GPUs on chips got better on the devices. So to me, that was very similar to the telecom wave and the, and the web where transit got faster, everyone got faster bandwidth, internet got faster. So you know, he and I were riffing and others were saying, hey, if you assume that NVIDIA is going to do their job and Intel is going to get back in the game, which they are, and Amazon is going to step up, more compute, more GPUs, more systems on chip, more stuff happening at the silicon layer, then that advancement will only power the ability to do the training and inference on any device. So that's kind of what the thesis was. And that's that was not contrarian. That was kind of just obvious. Now, you're seeing Llama playing out on smaller devices. So if you're Dell, you're in the PC world, you're looking at our Armageddon, unless a new thing comes along like AI, which makes your hardware more valuable. <laughs> which is happening yeah. so, so so you know and we called that it was it was good to see it but you know they have an opportunity dell hpe lenovo the folks making pcs and devices are in an opportunity to create a renaissance in their business of saying look at same game new processing new architecture in, in microsoft obviously and i want to mention something else about the uh the power law and you i i take a lot of credit for the power law but you're the one who gave me the idea and a lot of the background you worked on it very closely with me and Rob Strecce. But what, one of the things that you pointed out, which was your sort of innovation, was that torso getting pulled up to the right of uh, 40, 45 degree angle by open source. And I have some brand new data that's not been released, but I'll share it here just as a teaser right. from ETR. They're going to be, they're in quiet period right now and they're going to release uh, their results in, in, uh, in a couple of weeks. But Llama 2, has in a survey, this, the latest survey of 1,700 enterprise IT decision makers, Llama 2 has about 17% more installations than Anthropic, which I found really interesting. Um, and, and oh, by the way, OpenAI has about 7X uh, the, the, the installations over those two. So, but the point being, the, exactly what you said, that Torso being pulled up to the right by open source and Llama 2 getting a lot of traction and to Matt Baker's post being applied in, in, in situations that are smaller. The other point, data point is at the Dell Tech Summit, I met somebody from Meta, it was like uh, uh, cornered him on the bus ride about how much of their installations of Llama were on-prem. And they said, we don't really know, but we can infer from who's downloading them. And based on the ETR data, I've calculated about 30% are on-prem. He said it could be as high as 50%. Now I'm pretty confident the ETR data doesn't include three letter, uh, of, you know, like the NSA agencies and supercomputer installations. So that number could be much higher. It's probably somewhere between 30, 40, maybe even as high as 50%. So that we're, we're starting to get data that validates some of the anecdotal information that we had been talking about before. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and I, I think that points to the thesis that you're going to see models on devices. And again, I think I can't, say this loud enough, I've been shouting it from the, the mountaintop for years and even this past year, the entire data business is going to be upside down in the next 24 months. You cannot operate the data strategies you've been doing, companies have been doing for decades with the new model. Data needs to be available for any app, 
at any time, anywhere. And that means either co-locating the data, because you can't change the laws of physics. Data's got to move around or be there when you need it. How do you make data available and highly addressable for every application, every inference? If that's a new indexing change with a vector database or something else, the entire data marketplace, industries are going to be completely radically changed. This is, has to happen. It will think, not, it's not going to happen with data warehouses and just Snowflake and Databricks. Yeah, data lakes will be around. Everyone's predicting that another year, data lakes. It's the year of the data lake. It's been that way for years. The data architecture has to be very agile, very accessible. But think about how complicated that is because you've got you've got all all these stovepipe you know data platforms. Whether it's within AWS, you got multiple stovepipes within Microsoft, Google. You got Snowflake. You got Databricks. So you got all this data, and you're not going to move that data. You're going to bring AI to that data. That's the big theme. Okay, but if you got co-pilots now operating on that data, which data do the co-pilots operate on that's coherent and current? How do you know, you know, what is the system of truth? It's, so this is a real challenge. So that's why you're seeing things like, you know, metadata unification, unity yeah. catalogs, uh, you know, the, try, the attempts to eliminate data movement and, and ETL. So there's going to be a, a, a yeah. burgeoning market, you know, around data coherence and then brings yeah. up the governance issue. So it's a very complicated matter and one that, you know, we're going to pay a lot of attention to this year. You know, um, the folks listening, if you're interested in what we're going to be covering this year, we, Dave's doing a breaking announcement on predictions. We got a lot of people from our Cube Collective weighing in. But to me, uh, in summary, that, you know, the 2024 is going to be a pivotal year because of the realm of, of, of AI, right? The AI world's here and you're seeing it impacting VC investments, startups that are being funded, look at what's being funded, what's not being funded uh, in AI and tech. Um, plus the advances of AI are impacting infrastructure, um, data technologies and security. So to me, data related technologies, platforms, tools, the picks and shovels, platforms are gonna be the, the big focus. Security, developers uh, and investment. You're gonna see those are the hot areas are gonna be burning with energy, either burning down or firing up. And so look at the VCs, series seed and series A fundings will be a marker. Look at the AI production workloads and then look at the data technologies and the apps that are the best. Can the Uber of the enterprise, you've called it Dave. And I think the shift in the VC investments are already clear. You're already seeing the data come in. So they're predicting a worse year in 2024 in VC than 2023 mainly because the bulk of the market of the previous bubble is going to be impacted and squeezed and or, or normalized, if you will. So, you know, I'm expecting infrastructure, old school players like Dell and new emerging chip players to benefit. Uh, and then security. I think the security market's going to be huge this year. I think it's a great time to invest too uh, for you know all, all the LPs out there. I, I'm going to invest in another fund coming up I, I think 2024 is you know, going to be a good time to to launch new funds. You know, valuations are getting squeezed a little bit. Of course, you know some of the AI valuations are a little bubblicious. But if you can if you can pick the right companies, I think you can do really well. Um, yeah. in, in you know when 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 you we talked about this in earlier cube pods that that those the zombie corns or whatever they call them that were getting <laughs> you know crazy funding in 2021 really struggling now with the runways. Um, and so, you know, this, what is it? I think Michael Dell said at one time that that he loves a good rainstorm because it cleans out the streets, you know? So. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting, rainstorm, you know, those that rain, rain's got to collect somewhere and, you know, the data lakes, again, I was joking earlier, but the data lakes will, will are going to be huge. Again, again, I saw one prediction, oh, data lakes is going to be the dominant data archive. Okay, I get that. But if you look at the business intelligence market and separate that from, say, what observability, where observability is going, you're seeing more cloud and distributed edge computing. So companies like Cloudflare are doing well. Um, you're going to start to see edge uh, inference, right? So I think one of the things that, that Matt Baker was talking about was inference is not so much the big deal because it's going to come from these models. But I think he's missing a key point. The smaller the devices that be able to hold two LLMs, the better inference you can do there. So, you know, I think the edge piece is going to be big. 
set up. You think he's missing that? You think he's missing that? I think he could. I think he worked for Dell. I mean, he's like, no, I don't think he's missing. I think he he could have really amplified. He just didn't. He didn't call it out as much. It would have been. It would have been the um, you know, the the swan song to his post because it would have been like, hey, the ultimate will be to prove his point is on the silicon side is that my device, whether it's a Dell device or Dell enabled uh, device at the edge and it could be as small as a wearable, right? So again, the you know how I feel about that, John, it's going to be arm powered. I mean, in a big way. Yeah. So again, Dell's in the business of making PCs. And again, they're resilient. We talk about Dell all the time because remember they had the web, the web was supposed to kill mail order. Well, so we know what they did. <laughs> they sold them online. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they sold PCs yeah. online. Again, they were in the PC server business then. But if you look at Dell, they weren't really in the server business until the web. Until Michael Dell converted over from PC mail order to the World Wide Web, where you can get online on a browser and order your own PCs, they really nailed their supply chain because of the internet. So the internet was a disruptive enabler for Dell itself to create a supply chain advantage and build that supply chain. You know, the patent, they're, they're famous, put the suppliers around your area, which Dell did. And that's kind of mm -hmm. historic perspective. But Dell Technologies, Michael Dell's success was because of the internet, in my opinion. That enabled him to manage the order in, in ease of ordering, which made his supply chain more efficient. And the rest is history. They dominated the server business. And they'll the crush they'll crush the internet there's no doubt about that and so <laughs> so what 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 Matt baker's getting at and what the strategy vivek who's running strategy when we had that meeting with them was ai is their next wave and they will play because they're in the hardware business and hardware matters so so if you look at all the action right now from anyone who's age 15 to 50 or higher they want the fastest stuff you know, because the developers are writing stuff for the new infrastructure. So again, developers are driving the agenda on AI. If you look at the, the hugging face numbers, uh, the leaderboards, look at what's going on at open source. You mentioned Llama 2. The, the Llama 2 uptake based on your research you just can't put out in the pod here is direct result of open source. And Meta um, hit a home run. I think we talked about that in pod last year when they released uh, Llama. Um, you know, we were like, hey, they missed the metaverse. Might as well get in with uh, AI. Uh, but again, AI is only going to help the VR market, Dave, because <laughs> AI well, will make VR better because if you go digital, you're going to have AI augmenting developers and the ex user experience you, for you, VR. I think I think the metaverse is going to get a huge lift. You, you just, well, it's funny. You just you just stated my, my one of my 2023 predictions was, was that uh, generative AI hits where metaverse missed um, and you know, you may say, okay, that's obvious, but I just did a predictions post with a, a bunch of Cube Collective guys known as the Data Gang, Sanjeev Mohan, Tony Bear, Carl Olofsson, Dave Menninger, and Doug Henschen. And we did one in, this is our third in a row, third year in a row, we did 2023, no mention from those guys of Gen AI. And of course, everything had Gen AI this year. Um, now, because they're deep in, in the weeds of their, their data platforms. And of course, you, you know, <laughs> their rationalization was that open AI was a little bit early, you know, a lot of experimentation going on. So they kind of walked that back. But, but so I was actually happy that I made a call a year ago that, you know, Gen AI was going to be big, even though it seems kind of obvious, but I'm not down on metaverse. I'm, I'm picking up on what you said. Uh, but, but before I get off this, these guys came up with, I'm going to be posting tomorrow. They are so smart when it comes to data. Um, intelligent data platforms, simplifying database design, unifying uh, 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 and, and rationalizing uh, uh, metadata. Uh, Gen AI, Dave Menninger, Gen AI is not going to replace traditional AI and, and all these use cases. And then Doug Henschen talked about how it's we're going to completely sort of change the way in which we think about the whole data pipeline. So they did a really good job. We're going to go deep, um, <laughs> publish all that tomorrow. Uh, we love, love collaborating yeah. with other really smart analysts. Well, I'm going to lay out right now what I see as the editorial agenda for SiliconANGLE and our coverage area that's going to be mainly my prediction post because these are areas that are going to go deep uh, for, for multiple years. Um, and obviously they're going to reset the agenda in the in the industry landscape from venture capital, AI, and technology. Number one, the IPO market and M&A market. You're going to see um, maybe 
one or two IPOs, maybe Databricks, but not a lot of IPO action. Maybe the second half of the year for the ones that have been that missed the window. But for the most part, one trust, maybe one trust might go Stripe, Databricks, whatever, you know, the, the ones that kind of missed it, but, but have massive power and traction and, and relevance that are going to be obvious home runs that are already successful. They should have been public anyway, but we'll go public. The rest is going to be M&A. You're going to see a lot of dying companies, Walking Dead to actually completely shutting down to a roll-up M&A market. Um, so that's going to be one. We'll be covering a lot of that stuff. Um, AI and data dominance, um, AI and data technology will continue to lead in the funding uh, with some companies getting more exceptional growth rates. They hit the home run. They get the lightning strike. Uh, consumer search will see a significant shift for proxies of the world. So big AI data dominance. New shit's going to come out of the woodwork. New companies, new brands. We're going to see just that next Google come up. Cryptocurrency, Dave, in Web3. I, I'm watching this. So I was, you converted me last year. So with Bitcoin hitting 45,000 and the ETF on the horizon, I think you're going to see, start to see the foundation of legitimate action around funding. So I think, you know, the fraud side of the whole shit coins and the fraud going to be go away. I think we're going to see decentralization and web three come back with real crypto, not fake crypto. So I'm putting it out there. We're going to watch it. Um, VC well, let, me, let me, let me just follow up on that. You know, you, I think correctly pointed out a lot of the crypto developers went to AI and I said, hey, I think AI and crypto are going to come together. And I think this could be the year where we see that this year yeah. or maybe next year. Um, I think yeah. you might see that. And you mentioned yeah. Bitcoin hit like 45, you know, thousand. Yeah. It dropped down. It, people sold. They were like, hey, let's yeah. take some profits. So I don't think it's quite ready to rock it back up to, uh, you know, over 60,000. But, no, we'll but, I, but I, think, I think you'll see legitimate action come back and i don't mean that that's gonna be a massive shift but like you said developers will oscillate between ai and crypto because there's synergies there if done properly again i pointed out some of the decentralized uh, things on the last pod uh, but we're watching it carefully um vc trends will be huge i think you're going to see the continued rise of solo venture uh, partners coming out with solo funds solo gp will be a continued explain to be a trend. what that means a solo a solo so venture partner what do you a, mean by a that a solo gp is a individual person who basically acts as their own venture capital firm. They raise between five to 20 million and they're either a domain expert, subject matter expert, or a former entrepreneur or a VC from another firm. And there's only one partner and there's only one person. They make all the decisions. There's no big partnership. Um, and the thesis behind that is they can get in the deals early and they go into areas where they see the smoke before the fire, so to speak, as things start to blow up good. Because the bigger firms are are replacing the traditional VC Series A, Series B, are going to end up doing the bigger rounds now that the private equity guys are dropping out of that financing. So it's just been proven that a lot of these solo general partners have been very successful. Zach Kalias is one I know in the Valley here. There's many more. Um, and also it's very democratized. Um, you can have um, anyone become a VC if they just make the right bets. Again, you, you know my philosophy, team. I think VC investing is easy. No, I mean, seeing what's going to win, that's pretty obvious to us. Why um, do you think this is a successful model? It's just they're because they're more focused. The, because they can get ROIs better because they know the bets early and they can get in early deals. So they can hit of the right deals, the right set, if they have the right amount of capital. If they're spraying and paying, that's one thing. But a solo GP has can go can make decisions very quickly. And they're usually trusted and usually have more value add. And again, they don't, they usually stay within their realm of expertise. They don't, they have out of scope uh, factors. In other words, they take a very narrow scope and they say, I'm only going to invest in this area through these colleges. I'm going to watch this herd of uh, entrepreneurs come up. I'm going to know what a, what a winner looks like. And I'm going to have the vision to connect the dots. That's a winning formula versus a firm of 12 partners have internal politics. They, one guy didn't fund the other guy's deal. The females aren't, aren't represented and there's no underrepresented minorities. It's all white guys. So that's like, it's like, it's like, the old VC um, metaphor, you know, a bunch of guys sitting around the room and they it's slower and they are bigger. They got a billion dollars on their capital. So the bigger firms want these scout funds. They used to be called scout funds. Now it's like just invest. And you start to see Karitsu's form. Again, it's, it's, it's a trend because a big firm has to put all this capital to work. They don't want to spend the time to write a $30,000 check or a million dollar check. They want to write a $20 million check or a $50 million check. 
And so that's where the economics change. So that's a VC capital trend. And also, I think the startups on the AI side right now are the canary in the coal mine. And we're going we're gonna to do a lot of coverage with startups. You're going to see us doing a lot more cube videos around AI startups. And that's the big area. Again, the next area is AI regulation and productivity. We cannot ignore the regulation. In fact, there's a lot of stuff going on over the holidays around um, the the uh, political article that was going around saying that this whole Silicon Valley culture of pessimists and you know um, D cell are infiltrating the politics, which is complete BS. And first of all, I thought the article was a great article by Politico. I'll put the link in the show notes. But um, their premise was is that there's a huge Silicon Valley AI contingent in DC putting the doom and gloom into the political realm around AI. And it's not optimistic. It's not um, positive, at least in my opinion. So I, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't like that article. So I think we're going to watch this regulation game because it's game played around policy makers. Policies are basically lobbyists. So if you're in policy, you're a lobbyist. Lobbyists aren't adding value. They are lobbyists. They don't build anything and usually are on the payroll of someone trying to set an agenda. And so when you start getting into a world where you have agenda setting and obfuscation and politics and lobbying, you have a lot of misinformation, uh, a lot of astroturfing going on, um, and a lot of misinformation campaigns. <laughs> So do you think it's always, you think lobbying, I mean, I'm generally not a fan either because there's a lot of waste that goes on, but you think it's always a negative? Is it, is there any positive outcomes of lobbying? I mean, I'm thinking about- yes. yeah, there is. I'm, I'm thinking about like in the 80s with the Semiconductor Industry Association, you know, going after you know, lobbyists trying to compete with Japan when they were dumping, you know, DRAMs on the market and, you know, hurting Intel and others and- yeah, you I mean, remember I, that. And so, well, I mean, the, they, they do play a role, but there's, you know, but, but a lot of times, you, you know, they go too far. Right. And it's just, yeah. it, it, you have unintended consequences, I'll say. Yeah. Well, there are examples. And again, um, like I always say, you reign in the chaos after you let it rain, let, let chaos reign and reign in the chaos. Sorry. Sorry. Gee, thought you could say it a lot. I actually say it more than you on the queue, but, 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 but here regulation, Matt, I'll give you an example of good policy. During the internet days, when the U S created the internet, the policy standard by the government was let's keep it open. And so it was, the, it was an extra effort for the U S government and lobbyists around the tech industry at that time, network solutions, um, and then became VeriSign. That's, they ran the DNS servers with the power of the internet. There was an effort to take those away from the U S to make it completely fractured. And so there was a set of poly lobbyists, lobbyists or poly make poly policy gurus that was making an argument or educating people around the benefits of open. And that worked until it got too big where you start to have a little bit more, you know, so, uh, sovereignty issues. And then uh, ICANN became more of a global organization. That's some another history point there. So policy and lobbying should be about education, not managing direction per se. Invisible hand a little bit here, but not over the top of the hammer. So to me, bad policies when you're basically, you know, taking a blunt instrument to a lawmaker's head and saying, I want to see it this way. I'm getting paid. I'll pay you quid pro quo, some, you know, dirty politics versus education on the, on the value. And so policy should be open and transparent like it was with the domain name system. So again, that's one, one example, other examples you mentioned. So, you know, AI regulation should match productivity and some philosophy, whether it's openness or safety in the sense of AI. So we're going to watch that. So regulation is going to be um, anything that has to do with government regulation and policy or um, and governance. Usually there's probably some hassles in there, inefficiency. Again, again, this is my personal opinion. It's a rant section item, but we're going to follow it this year heavily. We're going to have probably some DC folks covering it for us. Um, and then the area, next area is data architecture and evolution. I mentioned data lakes. We're going to be covering Amazon. Amazon announced some innovations in storage. You're seeing silicon. You got Cloudflare. You got a lot of um, you know architectures around semantic web. You've been talking a lot about this next gen pl data platform, sixth platform. You know this is real. This real change happening with the compute and and um, processing power, TPU, GPUs. Uh, Grok has got an inference chip. Uh, another great company we've been covering. So data architecture evolution. Heavy access to this one this year. Tons of content. It's going to impact DevOps, DevSecOps, everything. 
And then Gen AI startups, we'll cover them like the cows come home. We're going to do that, no problem. And then multimodal models, Dave, and AI operations. I think that's going to be huge. You're already starting to see it now. Uh, AI operations in, in cloud, not the old AI ops, it's the new AI ops. We're going we're to get into that. That's DevOps. And then uh, DevOps, confidential computing, and then emerging technologies like WebAssembly, uh, WebAssembly, Wasm, and others is going to happen. So those are the areas. Last two were multimodal models and AI ops and DevOps ad, uh, adaptation wow. and confidential computing. There's a, there's a lot there. I, I haven't done my predictions post yet. I'm going to do it end of the month with, uh, with Eric Bradley. And we're going to look at you know the macro spending like we always do. I'm definitely going to hit on the uh, 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 neck, you know six data platform. Um, no question, we're going to have some kind of Gen AI you know predictions. I have a stack. I don't, you know, I'm sure you get them too, right? You get all these inbounds of predictions. Hey, John, you're doing predictions post this year, <laughs> and PR people sending in predictions. I literally have a stack like this. I mean, I have thousands and thousands and thousands of predictions. Maybe not thousands, but I bet you I have a thousand predictions that I, it takes me a week to go through them. And I get out the highlighter and I don't use a lot of them, but I get ideas from them and I give credit to, to those that I think are um, both thought leading and can be um, measured. In other words, did it come true? Can you, it, my, my philosophy, John, with predictions is somebody, some independent should be able to look at your prediction and you know the detail around the prediction and say, okay, it's binary, it, it came true or it didn't, or at least have some kind of ability to grade it. Part of it came true, part of it didn't. So we always strive to, to make those predictions you know, a little bit harder or to put some data points around them or percentages around them and then have yeah. ways, whether it's for instance, you know, IDC data on how fast the market grew, although, you know, or Gartner data, whatever, yeah. use that as the benchmark uh, it, or even our own surveys, you know, look, yeah. look back surveys. and so. I feel like that's an important thing that's missing in many of the yeah. predictions. I think the predictions are actually, most of the predictions, I'd say 95% of them are yeah. trends. Okay, this is a trend. Yeah. So you're noticing a trend and that's good, that's useful. But predictions should be like, this is going to happen. Did it happen? The Patriots are going to you know, get the first draft pick. You know, that's my prediction. Or make, the, play so or the, or make, or make the, the playoffs. Or make the playoffs. Did it happen or not, right? So. Yeah, I mean, Celtics that's what, are going to win I mean, the, the, I mean, I, the, the predictions, NBA. Predictions are hard. I mean, to me, what I what I try to do is I try to identify like like where you plant your crops this year, right? Okay, what's going to happen this year in 2024? What's the fertile ground? So to me, it's areas of interest to program around. As we set the agenda for Silicon Angle uh, and look at our community, we look, we take all those predictions and we kind of boil them up into saying, okay, here's the areas that we're going to dig into. Because um, one of the requests this year, that we're going to do that we got a lot of feedback on last year, Dave, as you know, is our CUBE alumni and our expert network of 18, 20,000 plus people have all been kind of chirping, hey, do more unpacking like super cloud on, on camera. Bring people that are experts in on camera and unpack issues. Like what's the future of DevOps? And you, know, you want to do those in areas that are going to be relevant and cool. So, you know, the areas I just laid out were more kind of editorial areas we're going to dig into and they might be a couple layers deep and we set up oh, not not much there or it could be a big gusher like if if crypto hits we're going to be there so you do enough surface area coverage dig into it see how it goes but obviously ai is undeniable this is the year that ai starts to happen in a in a way that's going to be the transformative signals emerge and 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 those are to me like i said the investment climate what's tracking you're going to see the winners start to emerge quicker, quicker this year. The production workloads, you're going to start to see those emerge pretty quickly. You know, so it's going to be the year of observation. What popping, what's popping, what's not happening. That's going to be easy to hit. The I second wish. one is what's the, okay, underlying, just... what's the underlying infrastructure change? Because the infrastructure will set the agenda for the applications. That's why changing. I'm hardcore on the data. The data piece changing. is huge. And it's and it's the infrastructure requirements are changing pretty dramatically. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, look at Microsoft just put a, a key on the keyboard, okay? Copilot <laughs> on the keyboard, <laughs> okay? I think that's a pretty interesting uh, trend line right there. You know, like changing a keyboard to put a copilot key. So that's that, that that's not a signal of of relevance. Well, to so your uh, you theme know. of AI everywhere, I mean, that's it's true. It's going to be everywhere. I I. I you know, it's a it's 
it's an interesting time, right? Uh, I've said this before. Solipsky at reInvent said, we've have, have seen worse times, we've seen better times, never seen such uncertain times. Um, I, I think things are starting to calm down. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the market this year. I mean, the stock market actually did incredibly well. Everybody was predicting recession, recession, recession last year, and it never happened. And now people are like, oh, rate cuts, rate cuts, rate cuts. And so, you know, I'm not sure I would be predicting, you know, rate cuts. I think there's probably going to be less than people expect. Um, and, and I think the market post COVID is still very unpredictable. Yeah. And, you know, and this is happens when you get these transitions. We've seen a lot of these wave transitions. What happens is the new stuff is not, which, which is getting all the hype and all the valuations. It's not big enough, not nearly big enough to offset the old. And you're seeing this now with AI spending. AI experiments and spending, definitely, you know, 30 or 40% of the spending is coming from other places. And yeah. so you're seeing a compression in other budgets you're not seeing a huge top line growth in IT spend. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, the new stuff's not paying back enough. And so you don't, you, you get this weird sort of offset imbalance that creates dissonance and, and uncertainty, uncertainties in the marketplace. And, and that's, I think, yeah. what we're seeing now in a, in, a, in a way that we've seen before, but we've never seen the pace of change yeah. happen I, this quickly, I, at least I, in my experience. I predict that this year will be a year of optimism, okay? I predict that um, you'll see more optimism than pessimism. That's my prediction, um, uh, mainly because the the the, the scale is already starting to tip a little bit. You start we'll to see. We'll so, see. So, he, so here's a question. And I think the developers and open source drive that, and also look at the narrative, some of the conversations. Okay. 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 So here's the question then. So this past year, 2023, was a year of pessimism, which was not founded. I mean, you, the the result was you, you should have been an optimist from an investor standpoint, right? Do you feel like the the optimism will be rewarded in 2024? In other words, I mean, you saw the S&P grew, what, 20% 20, 20 last year? I, it's, it's very rare, if ever, you see back. I mean, I think it happened in 1999. We had 98 to 99 or 90. Yeah, 98 to 99. I think you had back-to-back 20% mm -hmm. S&P 500 growth. It's very, very rare. Do you think that optimism will be rewarded in 2024? I do. I think you're going to see. Um, I think you're going to see the VCs who are going to recognize where the optimism is on that customer conversion. There's 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 optimism, and enthusiasm in the startup community. You don't need more optimism there. I think the VCs are pretty bullish on where they're at. There, the ones that are in the trenches. Um, I think the optimism has to be more mainstream. And again, that that's why the DC thing caught my attention because they're they're saying the wrong narrative. Um, it's not just not pessimism. It should be optimism. Um, and there's an article that was written. Um, I thought a great article around that from a, a successful entrepreneur um, or this week. The issue on reward is going to come down to um, uh, uh, valuation increases because the payback on using AI to change either the value of your business or change your business will be one to watch if you're an existing company like ours. If you're a startup, Getting something mark, product market fit is going to be different. I think that's where the rewards are going to be. So, I think a lot of people just need just to under, they need to understand where's the line between safe AI and bad AI. Because again, there's a lot of bad AI just as much as there's good AI. It's, it's everything's symmetrical, right? You can whatever's good good over here. There's an opposite effect, and that that to me is where it is now. I tend to look at the other side of the coin. If people are talking about how bad AI is here, I look at it on the other side and say, where is it good? And that's going to be interesting to see. I think, and the other thing I'll predict is I think there's going to be a continued regulation, um, a mindset around um, the government trying to tack, take big firms down because I think um, Amazon, Facebook, now Meta, uh, Google, Apple, they're going to be under scrutiny. In, in fact, you know, just today, New York Times just posted an article that the DOJ might file an antitrust law suit against Apple, okay, um, around its dominance of the iPhone. Yeah, suit, can, suit, can, du, suit can, du jour. You were can, so successful. Can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine if Steve Jobs was alive? iPhone, <laughs> you're too good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to break so, you up. You know, it sounds like Microsoft and go back into the '90s. You know, so. Um, I just so find if, that if, incre well, incredible. I mean, Microsoft, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how 
but, successful but, they but, are. But back, to, back to your reward, though. I mean, but, on our but, last podcast, we talked about the S&P 500, Dave. You saw all the analysts at the end of the year. It was a great year. You invested in in uh, Facebook, Meta, M- Apple, Amazon, Alphabet. Uh, yeah, the big seven. Uh, um, Berkshire but so, and J.P. Morgan. I mean, the okay, S&P 500 and, was up, up and, huge. And by the way, I think the rich, those rich, the magnificent seven, I think they keep getting richer. Um, despite all the, the, the potential, you know, activism against, you know, government coming after him and so forth. But if you're right, and I think you are, I think, I think optimism will be rewarded. And I think one of those rewards is going to come in the, the form of IPOs. I didn't really chime in before, but you mentioned Databricks. I think Databricks, I mean, Databricks based on the data, the survey data is doing incredibly well. Anecdotally, we knew that we knew that we know they're doing well. You interviewed so many customers at the Databricks Data Plus AI Summit last year. They're doing, they're doing, you know, kicking ass. We know that, but they're not a public company, so they don't have these quarterly catalysts for whether it's news or you know earnings news, earnings prints. Yeah, they can make a product announcement, but it's yeah, it's not as it's compare that to like Snowflake. Every quarter, you know, you get to dissect it, and I know they're on the you know, ninety day shot clock, but there's to me some advantages despite all the compliance concerns of being a public company, just from a marketing standpoint and, a, and an awareness standpoint. And I yeah. think that confers yeah. advantages to those public companies. So I'd yeah. love to see data. I'd rather, for instance, be UiPath than automation anywhere. Yeah. You know, even I, though UiPath got it, crushed if, you know, in, in the market initially, I'd rather, I'd rather have a public forum where I can say, this is what I, I can have a say do ratio that people can track. Look, this is a great point. I mean, we can next let's unpack this next week, but I, I think we should put a pin in this because this is exactly the opportunity that I see. The data versus world, the UI pass, the, and the companies that were funded or overfunded in the last cycle. There's two companies in that last cycle that got overfunded or and that are doing well. The data bricks of the world and and the ones that didn't make it. So it's becoming clear to the capital markets right now, very clear, which companies have a path forward and which ones don't. Okay, and if the, the ones that don't have a path forward, they didn't get the product market fit. They have limited product differentiation. They don't have what it takes. They got to know. I mean, if you're the entrepreneur and you're the founding team or the investor, um, you got to have a soul searching moment and you got to look inside yourself and say, look, it. do we have what it takes? Do we have a path forward? And a lot of companies are going to either saying, I'm going to have to land this plane softly in another company and act you higher or target a UI path, or that plane's going to crash, run out of gas and fall out of the sky. This is what's going to happen. And, and this is an opportunity for UI paths of the world. These companies are going to can pick up a bunch of accu hires. So if I'm a, a, at UI path or a company like UI path, that's got great position. I'd be looking at all the white space and saying, okay, where's my product gaps. Let's pick up that company. Let's pick up that company because you can pick up teams right now. The startups that don't have a path forward have some people, and some tech. Grab that tech, plug it in. So to me, that's what I would be well, doing. And then the ones that have a path forward, they're going to go public. It, Databricks will go public. Very Stripe interesting. Will go public. It, it's very interesting to look at, you know, the haves and the have-nots and the AI washing and all that stuff. I mean, you mentioned UiPath. You think that's a company that started in RPA and has moved into, you know, intelligent automation. And there is a difference, by the way. RPA is a point tool, um, you know, kind of a desktop point tool. And intelligent automation is a much broader, you know, agenda. But you think about it, it, generative AI; it's going to do a lot of the things that RPA was designed to do, and that's a lot of the business of UiPath and Automation Anywhere and Blue Prism and guys like that. So, so they're going to potentially be negatively impacted. There's a two-sided coin there. When you look at the spending data, and you look at, you know, you cross AI accounts with uh, certain RPA accounts. Some companies, you know, hold their own. Like certainly Mike, Power Automate with Microsoft holds its own. UiPath holds its own, actually, you know, boost a little bit. Others get depressed. When interestingly, when you look at, I, I just recently looked at this data, Snowflake really didn't have an AI strategy prior to Gen AI, right? They went <laughs> no. out and, 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 right? I mean, so they kind of, you know, poo-pooed it in a way and from my, you know, distance observation. So they went out and bought Mosaic ML and have begun to integrate that, the latest data actually shows they're getting an uplift from their a AI announcements and their, their marketing around that. Whereas of course, Databricks has always been, you know, deep, steeped in, in ML and AI. So, so that's kind of really interesting. It's interesting, my point being, we want to see how companies can respond and, and it'll separate the wheat from the chaff. In other words, yeah. 
hey, I, I didn't really necessarily have a, a, kick, a killer AI strategy. I, I made some acquisitions. I brought in some talent, to your point, some ac hires, and that's actually become a tailwind. It, it look, at, look at what Salesforce is doing yeah. on, 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 on TV with the Matthew McConaughey uh, ads. They're like, they're like more ads than IBM Watson ever had. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting, Dave, I mean, if, if you're Snowflake, clearly, I mean, we know, we talked to them. I personally had conversations with sales, Snowflake people that they were like, hey, AI, we're on it, but like, you know, really, we're not there yet. I'm sure they had people working on it, but it wasn't top of mind. Now the wave hits a year ago, they, it's an easy pivot for Snowflake. They're in the data cloud already. Yeah. They, it's not a hard bridge right. to build for them quickly. Okay, if you're a startup and you're saying series B funded, C or beyond, you either have to be in the Databricks category or you're either walking dead or there's a path out of the turmoil. You have to find the, that path. So are, am I, the questions that they're going to ask themselves are, am I walking dead startup or do we have a path? Can we find a path? And that's going to be hard. And the VC investors or the investors might want to have a call option, for instance. How long do they take before they either shut it down or make a play? So this is going to be a very interesting first two quarters of the year. You're going to see every conversation at startups go down that way. Am I walking dead or is there a path through? And then the board, do they have the balls? Do they have the guts to have the fortitude to say, let's make a call now? Or they want to keep the call option on valuation on a soft landing or roll the dice or go big or go home, crash and burn or clear the runway. That's well, where it's going to be. That's going to, that's, there's no, there's no market. It's decimating on the startups. If you're well, not an and, AI startup up into the right, you're out. And, and, and the other factor is what's the denominator in terms of the cost to actually launch a company. You certainly saw with the web, you know, it created opportunities to do things that you couldn't have done previously. Of clearly the cloud created this spate of SaaS companies that didn't have to go out and buy, you know, Unix servers and Oracle licenses. And, and the premise is that AI is going to allow you to, instead of having to hire, you know, 15 engineers, you can do the same amount of work with two or three engineers in, you know, one tenth the time. And, and I expect that that is actually a, a real thing. You know, we're seeing it with our own development, how fast we were able to get you know, to uh, actually a working product, MVP and then beyond, and then actually launch, you know, a public product. So I, I suspect this is going to have a huge effect on, 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 on speed to build a company, valuations, time to, time to value, time to return, and it's going to be competitive as hell. Well, it's going to be fun, Dave. I want to just close out the podcast by just making a reference to uh, an article by Anil Dash, who's the, um, uh, uh, he's a web original, I call him, uh, a big proponent of the open web, great guy, always got a great perspective. He wrote a great article for Rolling Stone um, magazine, and it's called uh, The Internet is About to Get Weird Again. Okay, it was written on <laughs> December 30th. Shout out to Anil Dash. Again, I'm a fan of Anil, so people, some people take shots at him, but the guy's t totally pro open web. Um, I think he's cool. I like his views. Um, some of them are a little bit out there, but there's nothing wrong with that. The, the title is called The Internet is About to Get Weird Again. And uh, it says, the new year offers many promises of the online moment we haven't seen in a quarter century. His basic premise is, is that we become so siloed with the LinkedIn's of the world and X going the way they're going and everyone, every tribe having their own little network that he's seeing a, a, a swing back, I should say, to the idea of the internet, the open web, the World Wide Web 1995. So it's interesting because we've been talking a lot about this on the pod around how we think the internet web movement is a lot of parallels to the AI side where you have telecom powered the web, which became information, superhighway, internet, and then the World Wide Web sat on top of it. This article is worth reading because a lot of the cool stuff that happened in the early days of the web were because it was open. So the question is, will AI go that same route? Or are we going to have more of an Apple, iPhone, Android model? Pick your closed walled garden. Is it completely closed? Or it's going to be open? So a lot of the debate in AI right now is about open source versus proprietary. It's kind of weird. This so is um, a pretty thoughtful uh, post here. I'm reading it now. It's like, it's pretty... Pretty well done. Um, it's, it's, and that, by the way, 
that was one of the premises for crypto, right? Was to build and to build a a, a distributed, you know, new internet. Exactly. <laughs> Silic <laughs> the show Silicon Valley. We're going to build a new internet with yeah. my compression algorithm. <laughs> right? And then there was another article by Brendan McCord from the Cosmo Institute. It's called um, uh, Pessimism versus Accelerationism. Okay. Um, it's this interesting long read, but it's a really about the, the the cultural change I was talking about earlier. And I think, you know, I think we're going to have a revolution in this generation of the internet and AI specifically, and that the younger generations coming online now who are building and setting the agenda and the standards and the de facto standards um, are going to have a little bit of a different view. I think it's going to be an interesting um, thing. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see as we have uh, the diversity of participation from us old guys, you know, multiple cycles of innovation, um, and then the spectrum of ideation. Am I a pessimist? Am I an accelerist, acceleration person? A D cell, an A cell, E cell? I wouldn't call it. It doesn't matter. The startups will define it. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the next wave um, uh, of optimism or pessimism drives it. So I thought both those articles were interesting, and and they both have different cultural impacts and neil's point is more like ours let it be open let it flourish new weird stuff good weird stuff will happen in a way the cosmo institute articles are really around this whole dogma around kind of your, your approach and the political article um that that went out i'll pull that one up real quick for everyone here but the let me pull it up politico well, and and but to your point on the latter, it's like there are a lot of Luddites who aren't going to agree with that, you know, the openness. It's like, you know, AI is going to going to ruin humanity. And I'm not saying there aren't risks there. Obviously, there are. Um, but it's called, you always say it. It's you can't called, stop it's, innovation. The, uh, the, the AI debate culture clash, DC, Silicon Valley. The title of the political article was when Silicon Valley's AI warriors came to Washington. Special report. Okay, just love the title. Total link bait when Silicon Valley's AI warriors came to Washington, like, like we're social justice warriors. It's just a so, it's just so good. Effective altruism is increasingly described as a cult, but the movements, but as the movement's billionaire adherents pour money into DC, it's obsession with the AI apocalypse is remaking, remaking the capital's tech policy landscape. I'll put it in, in our notes here, Dave, so you can look at it too. So it's just, it, it speaks it speaks to the the culture dave okay and so if this is if they're calling this the ai warriors from silicon valley that's not silicon valley it's just fyi guys it's not not what silicon valley is silicon valley isn't a bunch of the cop apocalypse people they're not looking at the end of the world it's just a small fringe this is not the social justice wars with silicon valley it's, it's actually the opposite so again i took issue with this one but it was a really great article um, and so I thought it was worth reading. It's provocative. Um, it's a it's a movement. Again, we talked about this in the pod before um, around the around the open AI board and leadership debacle. Um, but I think it's important to note, Dave, the cultural significance of, of our time right now. Well, it, I guess we run out of time here. We're ending, but it's an election year. You know, we haven't we haven't <laughs> talked about it, and uh, so that probably supports your optimism thesis in the markets anyway. Um, but it also uh, creates you know this huge divisiveness. I saw Joe Lieberman somewhere the other day, it might have been on CNBC, talking about uh, what do they call it? The no labels. It's a terrible name, but the no labels party, mm -hmm. which it's a it, and they're looking trying to figure out a a bipartisan ticket, both a Republican and a Democrat <laughs> on the same ticket. Oh, uh, go for it. I, I, I applaud that. You know, yeah. Good luck. I hope that happens. We need a change big time. Totally. All right. Well, Dave, great pod. Um, I guess we kind of had quasi rants. We're over time now. Um, great to see you. Happy New Year. So Yeah. Happy know. New Year. Not a ton of news, but next week, CES, John. There'll be a lot of news coming out of that, won't there? Well, I mean, I mean, this news happening right now. They got, we got the New York Times breaking that story about yeah. Apple. That's pretty huge. Again, CES, we're going to have coverage here at Silicon Valley at our studio. Savannah's going to be there. Rob Strecce will be there. Um, we're going to have a preview. Again, CES is easy to cover because there's so much coverage there. There's not much uh, other than coming out of the mainstream news. The Cube will not be live at CES. 
Uh, we'll have our team coverage on the ground, getting some data. We'll also have in-studio action. Dave, you and I will be doing some commentary as well. Uh, and of course, we'll have all the analysis on siliconangle.com. Again, another uh, great year ahead for SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. Um, shout out to our community, 13 years. Again, we look, this year's going to be the year of community participation. You're going to see a lot more people on the camera this year at theCUBE. You're going to see a diverse set of voices. Okay, John and Dave, us, will be on the pod. We'll be out headlining a lot of theCUBE. But you'll see a lot more hosts. you see a lot more experts. The Cube Collective, I'm super excited by that, Dave, your, your data gang. You're starting to see a thirst for truth, um, influence, real influence, real analysis. I think this is going to be the year where AI on the, on the media side, as media starts to implode, I mentioned Cheddar going out of business or having that furlough. Um, you're going to see a year where with AI coming on, this, on the scene, a lot of that content being synthetic content, you're going to see new algorithms for truth. You can see more quality rise to the top and you're going to start to see, you know, the pretenders start to be identified as, as they're recycling other people's ideas. So you're going to start to see a lot more kind of collective behavior in communities. And we're going to see a lot of that on the cube this year. So go to siliconangle.com. Of course, the cube.net will constantly be putting up more stuff there with the cubeai.com. Check that out. And Dave, we'll see you next time. Uh, great to see you. Thanks, That's John. All right. See you guys.